evening. This is the day two of uh, three days of the library is on fire in this uh, new staff room. First day preacher, second day today volume, third day tomorrow uh, traffic shot. I realized yesterday I did not really speak about uh, practical issues about this library. So I'll try to come back on it for 10 minutes and then we go on volume. So two years ago I met with a woman uh, called Maya Hoffman who founded uh, the uh, Luma Foundation uh, Art. I will compare it to a dance company but instead of producing an exhibition, they no, ballet, they produce an exhibition. And um, she had, uh, surrounded by a core group of artists and curators, a project for a new art and research institution to be set in south of France, in Halle. We met and we spoke and I said that I could work on a component of this institution, this component being the library. And something happened that is rare and lucky. She gave me a form of um, uh, unconditional, unconditional trust, which basically is a form of space and time to think of things. And the result of it is that I thought that it would be good to have a library composed of two hemispheres, like a brain, or of two poles, like a planet. One being the research library, the other one, the library is on fire. One, the research library, following some rules of academic research when you go with a preset cone of interest. And the second zone, where you will be exposed to the unexpected apparition of symbols and signs and forms communicating to each other. There's a quote I like by Emily Dickinson who says, um, nature is a haunted house, art is a house that tries to be haunted. And for a long time I thought of, uh, you know, the ghost train as being a good format of our uh, discoveries. Enter a volume and things like this. So this haunted part of the library come, because it will happen, it will be a real space in the years to come. Now the plan is 2015, it's called the Libraries on Fire. The librarian of the library is not a real physical library, is a, a being of fiction, is a creature, is a creature that what you know about it, it appears, and it, look, it looks in Films, in books, sometimes in songs, sometimes in video games, for the very form of its intelligence, it has to make progress. And so I want to, for the first year of this, so you have always a parallel line between the adventure of understanding of this creature and the acquisition of the library. What the library acquires correspond to what the creature needs to progress in his form of uh, quest for understanding. And I asked my friend Shimon behind me to start the first initial adventure or problem the creature had to resolve, which is to appear. So year one is this year, and the creature appears. And we thought that to appear, he needed two things, to be surrounded by other beings, that's why uh, day one is future, and to be surrounded, to uh, be put in a context of potential places to live in, this is volume. And this is how this room works. Here. So, um, that's it. Now, I'd like to thank, um, yesterday I could not remember the names, I'll try Nick, because this is simple. Thank you. Um, 
and then students of um, Shapes of Fiction, which is a course we've been doing um, on yeah, fiction. Uh, it's uh, Alvaro Pulpero, no. uh, Lilica, Giulio Bertelli, Elliot Rossi, and Christopher. <laughs> and Christopher Johnson. Um, that's it. And now it's uh, Schumann Bazaar for volume and we can uh, upload to send a signal. The dying Henry Dixon presses the volume of Edouard Poems into the creature's hand. He asks Natasha, have you ever read this book? Image in negative of the title cover of the book. Natasha replies, the capital of pain? No. The creature says, there's some words underlined in it. Read them. Natasha begins to read out aloud. We live in the void of our metamorphoses, but that echo that runs through all the day, that echo beyond time, despair, and the caress, are we close to or far from conscience? She interrupts herself. These are words, there are words here that I do not understand. The camera tracks very slowly as she is reading, emphasizing as she reads, the gradual falling away from her logical self as the creature imposes his power over her mind. He adopts a tone he remembers from his childhood. The voice is instructive and it soothes. He says, that book occupies a space much larger than it physically does. The creature gesticulates with his wiry hands and conjures an invisible volume in front of Natasha. In order to help her understand better, he describes a house. It's a modest sized house from the outside, and yet inside it's infinitely larger. If you tried to count how many rooms were inside this house, you would lose count. You'd eventually worry that you would never find your way back. The creature says, a book occupies a greater volume than it seems to occupy. Natasha replies, there are things here I do not understand. The creature, fortunately, is patient. He has done this many times before. On a piece of paper, he draws a dot, then a line in one direction, then another in the opposite direction, then a circle that envelops the dot and the two lines. He does this a number of times, with a grace that surprises Natasha. For is he not a creature, she wonders, and can creatures draw? See, he says, each volume extends inwards and outwards. And if you put them next to one another, they find their affinities with one another. They find another volume that is shared between them. One plus one equals three. November, do you remember Philip K. Dick speaking about Blade Runner? What in our world is there heaven? The neons firing in the street, completed newspapers that appear in a flash on screen. 
a sinister crown, the explosion of information each frame contains. The actors were immersed in a world when they were acting. There were details only for them to see, details that never appear on screen. When Decker scans and zooms into the Vermeer-like Polaroid through an optical grid, something invisible is revealed. If only you could see what I saw with your eyes. Diving along the immersed part of an iceberg, entering into the scenes. Do you remember watching Dangerous Days? Made 25 years after Blade Runner came out. 25 years after PKD had died. Strange. He never got to see the finished film. He described the 20 minutes he saw as absolutely my fantasy of what it would have to be like 40 years from now. In only a few years' time, it'll be 2019, the year the film is set. What if our future is Blade Runner's present? When reality catches up to fiction, it's beautiful. We're able to inhabit the date signaled in a book or film. Time capsules of the future. A book or a film has to have ended for us to read or watch it. They've already happened. He introduces the possibility of friendship between these two forms, the book and the film reinforcing each other. They both have their own logic. In his first script, Hampton Fancher imagined all scenes happening in small rooms. Then Ridley Scott asked, what's outside the window? So everything started. And through many levels of translation, the original story hasn't been faithfully adapted. The film invented its own intelligence. The animal thread has almost disappeared, but the film did capture the book's essence. A replicant who doesn't know she is a replicant. And its impact on all human self-examination. The unicorn origami will never be an answer to Deckard's identity. Just a crystal of pure ambiguity. A movie moves and a book talks. Someone said images and sounds make up eight out of the film's ten layers. What do you think the other two might be? Everything you can't see and can't hear. Everything that can't be said but is understood. Or rather felt a signal coming from an unknown distance. Here and elsewhere. Pas un monde, mais la possibilité d'un monde. Not a world but the possibility of a world. Natasha says, I think I can see with Rachel's eyes. The creature has drawn so many intersecting volumes, it has become a dark, almost pulsing mass. He asks Natasha, do you know what a library is? She nods her head, both yes and no, no and yes. The creature says, a library is an accumulation of these volumes. It is, therefore, more vast than it physically appears to be. Like the Nostromo, asks Natasha. Yes, like the spaceship Nostromo. And the sky, it is also a spaceship, and the Nostromo is one of its capsules. Is there sound in the library? Natasha wants to know this. The creature responds, no. And he responds again, yes.
Natasha asks, sound volume? The creature says, yes. Is there time in a library? Natasha also wants to know this. The creature responds, yes. And he responds again, yes. Les hommes prennent peur, peur d'être submergés par cette multitude d'écrits, par cet amas de mots. Alors, pour garantir leur liberté, ils construisent des forteresses.
qu'on soit emprisonné. On y trouve tout ce qui s'imprime en France. Tous les signes que la main de l'homme a tracés sont représentés dans le théorie de ce département, celui des manuscrits. Un spectacle toujours changeant se déroule dans la salle de lecture du département des périodiques. On y consulte la plupart des journaux du monde. Au cabinet des estampes sont conservées toutes les images, qu'elles soient gravées, lithographiées ou même photographiées. C'est un musée. Musée aussi le cabinet des médailles. C'est Louis XIV qui, le premier, y rassembla des trésors. Les étoiles, les satellites, les météores, les capitales et leurs banlieues sont à notre portée au département des cartes et des plans. Édifiée en un temps où on imprimait peu, la Bibliothèque nationale s'enrichit maintenant de quelques 3 millions de volumes par siècle. Pour éviter les plaquements, perpétuellement, elle s'enfonce plus avant dans le sol, elle s'élève plus haut dans le ciel. gigantesque mémoire soit possible, ceux qui ont charge des trésors qu'elle recèle les dénombrent. Ils les trient, les analysent, les classent, les numérotent méthodiquement. Il a fallu des siècles pour inventorier les 6 millions de livres, les 5 millions d'estampes conservées à la nationale. Travail indispensable car sans catalogue, cette forteresse ne serait qu'un pays sans doute. Il a fallu concevoir des disciplines qui, avec le temps, se sont muées en loi. Pour inventorier la masse de nos connaissances, il a fallu recourir aux mots-clés. Avec le temps, est né le grand catalogue des imprimés dont le propre est d'être toujours en chantier. Mémoire exemplaire, la nationale en magazine tout ce qui s'imprime en France. Un seul département, celui des périodiques, doit digérer chaque jour 200 kg de papier, de journaux, de revues, de magazines, de bulletins, d'annuaires et d'almanachs. Dépareiller une collection perd sa valeur. C'est pourquoi on s'interdit ici la moindre faute d'inattention. Si un numéro manque, il sera réclamé. Même si certains de ces imprimés ne devaient être consultés qu'une seule fois, il faut les conserver, c'est la règle du jeu. Parmi ces collections fut découvert le premier écrit de Rimbaud, publié par un obscur journal des Ardennes. Qui sait si ces feuilles ne recèlent pas quelque autre texte révélateur Qui sait ce qui, demain, témoignera le plus sûrement de notre civilisation Il y a quatre sources d'enrichissement pour la Bibliothèque nationale. Les dons, les achats, les échanges, et la principale, le dépôt légal. Institué au XVIe siècle, 
il oblige éditeurs et imprimeurs à livrer à la nationale plusieurs exemplaires de chaque ouvrage publié. Pour indiquer qu'un volume n'est entré à la Bibliothèque nationale, que plus jamais il n'en pourra sortir, on laisse en mille. L'ouvrage déposé est d'abord représenté dans le fichier où figurent tous les éditeurs de France. Puis il est inscrit sur le registre des entrées. Sa fiche signalétique est établie sommairement. Après quoi, prisonnier, il attend que vienne le jour du placement. Une fois par semaine, les livres sont soumis à un tri pour être répartis dans les différentes sections du service du catalogue. Certains, comme celui-ci, sont inscrits sur un fichier de collection. On situe le livre. On détermine à quelle science il se rattache. On l'identifie. On l'indexe. Électroniquement, on diffuse son signalement. 20 fiches le décrivant sont intercalées dans différents classeurs parmi les millions d'autres fiches qui font de cette salle des catalogues le cerveau de la Bibliothèque nationale. à aucune recherche. Une lettre, des chiffres, désigne la tablette qu'il occupera dans l'un des magasins. Catalogué, le livre va rejoindre le point précis qu'il est imparti dans le dédale d'un rayonnage long de 100 km. Citadelle silencieuse, la Bibliothèque nationale recèle d'innombrables trésors. Beaucoup mériteraient qu'on s'y arrête, mais sans film alors ne suffirait pas. Car qui peut dire ce qui est ici le plus précieux, le plus beau, le plus rare Serait-ce le manuscrit encore inédit du journal des Goncourt Le codex Theresianus que personne ne sait plus déchiffrer. <rire> Ces mémoires d'Harry Dixon, aujourd'hui introuvables. Ces carnets intimes qui ne seront ouverts qu'en 1974. Le manuscrit des pensées de Pascal. Ou l'ensemble des écrits des Zola. Une patate et les joyaux qui l'entourent. Mmh. 
l'album de croquis de Villard de Moncourt, ou bien encore ce médaillé royal, ces manuscrits géants de Victor Hugo, la map monde de Cabot, cette relure aux armes d'Henri II, ce livre, le premier imprimé à Paris, l'évangélière de Charlemagne, l'apocalypse de Saint-Sévère, ce Montaignac, ce Dureur, ce Renon. Ces richesses, il faut les préserver. C'est pourquoi l'air est contrôlé, l'atmosphère corrigée. Une machinerie, pareille à celle du capitaine Nemo, maintient une température constante, favorable au papier, au cuir, au parchemin. De jour et de nuit, les contrôles se succèdent. Coûte que coûte, il faut faire échec à la destruction. Un long dans savant préserve les reliures. On restaure les écrits des civilisations disparues. Les trous d'insectes sont obturés. Les feuilles éparses encollées. On vaccine les livres. On les gaine. Un rempart de plastique isole les cartes et les plans. Pour les préserver de l'usure, on range les portefeuilles sur des rouleaux mobiles. Quant aux journaux, dont le papier de bois se détruit lui-même, on les microfilmera. Captées, ces images perpétueront la mémoire des documents périssables. Mais tandis que se confie cette lente bataille contre la mort, des appels sont lancés, sans cesse, des messages fuse à travers le labyrinthe de ces magasins. Où tous les livres étaient égaux entre eux, 
où ils bénéficiaient tous ensemble d'une attention aussi tendrement glacée que celle de Dieu pour les hommes. Et le voici choisi, préféré, indispensable à son lecteur, arraché à sa galaxie pour nourrir ses faux insectes croqueurs de papier, irrémédiablement différents des insectes, en ceci qu'ils sont attelés chacun à une besogne distincte. Astrophysique, physiologie, théologie, systématique, philologie, cosmologie, mécanique, logique, poétique, technologie. Ici se préfigure un temps où toutes les énigmes seront résolues. Un temps où cet univers et quelques autres nous livreront leur clé. Et cela simplement parce que ces lecteurs, assis devant leur morceau de mémoire universelle, auront mis bout à bout les fragments d'un même secret, qui a peut-être un très beau nom, qui s'appelle le bonheur. The creature pulls a different book out from the shelf. He hands it to Natasha. She tries to read the cover. O, U, L, I, P, O. U, Li, P. Ouvroi de littérature potentielle. The creature translates workshop of potential literature. Natasha has a look of pure delight in her eyes, eyes that are silver, the way an old television screen was. She slowly utters these words. Vol, um, li, brad, ear, po, ten, Ah. The creature translates volume of potential library. He begins a story about a very old library in Alexandria, when it was the world's biggest metropolis with the world's largest library ever. And then he skips forward centuries in a few seconds to occasions when the contents of the library were burned. How it took six months to burn all the books. Imagine, says the creature to Natasha, the huge pyre of potential energy turning into smoke. Natasha takes a deep breath, considers the slow transformation of sound and silence and space and time in this thing he calls the library. And with those eyes that could only be the work of a computer that thinks like a human, she says to the creature, Volipo.
keep the library open for a short while, uh, otherwise upstairs the bar is open. And uh, as Charles mentioned, the last session is tomorrow at uh, a daytime time, at 1 p.m. It's more like a seminar, uh, it's with a really interesting film theorist and critic called Michael Brook. And as you saw in uh, that film, uh, the, the long film, uh, it's by Alain René, uh, it's called uh, La Memoir uh, du Monde. Um, you could see the tracking shot was used many, many times in there. And the tracking shot is something, uh, uh, if the library leaves an image, in our mind, uh, that image is the tracking shot. So we've asked Michael to come uh, tomorrow and uh, talk to us about the history and the significance of the tracking shot in the history of cinema. Um, and then that will kind of wrap up the three parts of uh, the library's on fire. So I um, hope you can make it tomorrow. Thank you.